Proverbs 31, verse 1. The words of King Lemuel, the oracle which his mother taught him. What, O son? And what, O son of my womb? And what, O son of my vows? How many of you moms say that, you know, from time to time? What? What do you want? Well, that's not what she's saying. Uh, (laughs) She's saying, what can I say to you? What words do I have for you, my son? Father, we come before you because we realize that you alone have the words of life. And we hunger after your words. And we don't search these words because we think that in them we have life. It is these that testify of you, Jesus. And so we come, Jesus, uh, before you this morning, asking you to give us your words of life, Lord, to give us yourself more of you in our hearts and in our minds. We want to be more like you in our walk, in our behavior, in the way we live and love and look at other people. And we pray, Father, as we study these final words of the book of Proverbs, um, that your wisdom would be given. Not something, Father, we can learn by our effort, but something we receive as we walk in relationship with you. Thank you, Father, for these words. Thank you for the blessing before it arrives. We praise you, and we listen now, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Does anyone remember as a kid rolling out the measuring tape to see how tall you were? Remember that? Some parents put a little mark on the wall you know, to track the height of the child. And it was always exciting to see if you had gained an inch or two. What if there was a measuring tape that could measure the height of your righteousness? Your growth in righteousness. You could pull that thing out, put it up against the wall, and, and see how you measure up. How would you measure up? If, you, if we were to do that right now, pull out the righteousness measuring tape, how would you measure up? Over these last several months of going through the Proverbs, I, I've recognized something. We've talked about many times, especially on Wednesday nights, that the book of Proverbs, the Mishle, as it's called in the Hebrew, is a measuring tape of righteousness. These standards, these words of wisdom, if we go and try to apply them, it's like learning to apply righteousness to our lives, and it's tough. This is not an easy book. Difficult not only because we had to take one proverb at a time to try and break it down and understand what is he saying, what are the words of wisdom here, but once we understand that, the reality is, here's righteousness. Do you want to be righteous? How do you measure up? We take the book of Proverbs, we stretch it out along the wall, and we can mark where we are in our walk of righteousness. And again, it's tough stuff. I quoted Bridges, Charles Bridges, at the very beginning of all this, saying, while other parts of Scripture show us the glory of our high calling, the book of Proverbs instructs us in detail how we should walk so that we are worthy of this high calling. It's heavenly wisdom for an earthly walk. And if we are to take these words literally, then we must also take them personally. Which means they've got to be applied. And that's where the measuring tape meets the wall, so to speak. How do we apply spiritual heavenly wisdom in a physical, earthly world of foolishness? And how do we measure up? And here at the end of Proverbs, just when you thought it was over, there is yet another standard. The challenge is set before us again, both for men and for women. But ladies, don't miss this, that God chose in his infinite wisdom to direct the last 22 verses of this book of wisdom to you. We begin this morning, however, though it ends with the ladies, we begin with a man, a king who penned these Last verses, the second and final appendix. We talked about chapter 30, the words of Agur is an appendix to the Proverbs. And then chapter 31 is another appendix that's that's added in as kind of a, a postscript, if you will, of the words of wisdom. And it's written by a man named Lemuel. King Lemuel. Hebrew limo means two or four. And the Hebrew word el meaning God. And so his name means to God. For God. But this doesn't speak of Lemuel's devotion. It speaks of his mother's devotion. She's the one who named him. She's the one who calls him to God. 
she names him Lemuel. In other words, saying this one is for God. Like Hannah, the mother of Samuel. Hannah, you may recall, she was a woman barren, unable to have children, and went into the temple and weeping and crying out and making supplication to the Lord. And in 1 Samuel 1.11, we're told she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And she did. He did, and she did. He gave her a son, and she turned around and gave that son to the Lord. It's that same kind of mentality that must have been in Lemuel's mother's mind when she named him for God and to God. I think about last week, Chris and Amanda Sanders at the end of second service, bringing up their two precious children, their their little baby, which you could almost hold in one hand, tiny little fella there. <laughs> And their daughter. And, and we prayed. And we had a dedication. We often will do those, those baby dedications. But I hope you understand, when we do baby dedications, it, it's not so much about the child as it is about the parents. It's not like we pray over this child and they receive a Teflon anti-sin coating. <laughs> you know, well, well, that one got prayed for, so that's why he's all right. But if you weren't dedicated as a baby, <laughs> I shudder to think. <laughs> It's about parents saying, for God. This one is for God. And we are devoting ourselves, we're dedicating ourselves to raise up this child in the way that they should go. And the church comes alongside in prayer support saying, we will pray for you. (laughs) We will pray for you as you make this endeavor. Well, that's what we hear in the name given to Lemuel by his mother. The words of King Lemuel, the oracle, Masa, the burden, the prophecy which his mother taught him. Verse 2, What, O my son, and what, O son of my womb, and what, O son of my vows, what can I say to you, she says. Having given you birth and having dedicated you to the Lord, what words can I offer to you to set your feet right, especially as you come into your role as a leader, as a ruler, as a king? What? And Lemuel's mother now will cover three areas. In this appendix for her son, number one, watch out for weakness to women. Watch out for weakness to women. Mama Dunn told me there'd be women like this. Verse three, do not give your strength to women or your ways to that which destroys kings. (laughs) This is serious. And the truth is to you young men, You can be as proud, macho, or chauvinistic as you want, but almost any woman can take you down. (laughs) David is prime example number one. (laughs) King David, the tough, giant-killing warrior king. What a man, a man's man. If there's any man in Scripture, aside from Jesus Christ, a real man's man, a tough guy, David's it. Man, he did it all. He was, he was a stud. And um, then he got married to his first wife, the daughter of Saul, a woman named Michael. She was a peach. <laughs> Second Samuel chapter 6, verse 20, following that glorious, wonderful day. Do you remember the story? They brought the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. First time didn't go so well. But the second time, oh, it was done right. He had the priests, the Levites, carrying the ark on the poles, as was intended. Every six steps they stopped. They worshipped the Lord. David danced with all his might before the Lord. It was pure, unadulterated, undressed up worship. There was nothing about it that wasn't just pure and honest before the Lord. A wonderful day. All Israel there, praising God, enjoying the wonder of the day. David, you know, you could almost see him coming on in the door of the palace with a little extra hitch in his giddy up. You know, he's, he's feeling good. And the Bible tells us when David returned to bless his household, Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How the king of Israel distinguished himself today. He uncovered himself today in the eyes of his servants' maids as one of the foolish ones shamelessly uncovers himself. What a bummer, you know? Praise the Lord! And then the wife's going, Nye, 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 It's like, what? <laughs> Did you, you weren't there to see what I, where have you been, woman? 
He didn't say that, but he did get on to her. They had an argument. She would never have children the rest of her life. Why? Well, two possibilities. One, God said you're not going to have children. And the other, David said, "Uh -uh." (laughs) uh-uh. By the way, you can best tell the character of a wife by how she encourages or discourages her husband. Ladies, that's where it comes out. (laughs) No patting your wife. She's going to get you later. It's absolutely true. The wife who is a spiritual, and I'm talking spiritually, encouraging her husband to follow the Lord and to be the leader he's been called to be, even if he's reluctant, the wife who is encouraging her man has great character. The wife who discourages the spirituality of her husband, not so much. 1 Samuel chapter 25, so Michael, that was done. In 1 Samuel 25, verse 42, we're told Abigail became his wife. She was the one originally married to Nabal, fool, and he was an idiot. And after his death, well, she became David's wife, second wife. David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel, and they both became his wives. Well, why stop with two, you know? (laughs) 2 Samuel 5.13 goes on to say, Meanwhile, David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he came from Hebron, and more sons and daughters were born to David. But that wasn't enough for David. And remember, we're staying with this. Watch out. Lemuel's mother says, watch out for a weakness to women. David's walking about the patio roof of his palace one spring. The rest of the kings are out to war and David stayed home. And as he's out there in the, in the cool of a Jerusalem evening, he notices a woman bathing, a beautiful woman. And it wasn't that he didn't have enough wives. Apparently he needed her too. He had to have her. And the sordid tale that follows that in King David's life was adultery, cover-up, murder, and deception. All from this supposed man after God's own heart. The Bible describes him that way. And David blew it. And he, because of his weakness for women, destroyed his family life. Oh, he would remain a man after God's own heart. And God, in his vast grace, would still forgive David and restore him. But his family would be an absolute mess, setting a course for the mega marriages of his son Solomon, who 1 Kings 11.3 tells us had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. Watch out for a weakness to women. Gentlemen, his wives turned his heart away. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of his father David had been. So, see, here's the difference. David's heart was different than Solomon's. Yeah, he had a weakness for women. Yes, he had too many women in his wife. But his heart, and the reason why David was called a man after God's own heart, is because David's heart was number one for the Lord. The women came next, or after, or later. In fact, I would venture to guess that no woman in David's life was ever loved the way he loved the Lord. For David, God was always first. David was strong in that, in his passion for the Lord. But Solomon's heart wasn't that strong. Moses' warning in the law was almost prophetic. Deuteronomy 17, 17. A king shall not multiply wives for himself or else his heart will turn away. You know, we talked about this a few weeks ago. Let me apply it again. You may think you're strong in the Lord, and perhaps you are. You may think in certain areas of your spiritual walk, you can handle things, and perhaps you can. You may think, I can take license or freedom with certain things. But the question is, how do you know a brother or a sister or a son or a daughter is not as strong as you are? And so, 1 Corinthians 8 and 9, Paul says, Take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Moms and dads, the weak, at least for a time, are your children. Are you a stumbling block for them? Are they watching behaviors in the household that you can handle? No big deal for you. But perhaps, like Solomon following David, they are the weak ones. Are you willing for your liberty to cost them their freedom? Lemuel's mother had good reason to warn her son about women. What about us today? 
When it comes to relationships, both for men and for women, one of the greatest causes of spiritual decline or even spiritual death is the persuasion of a person's spouse. And I've seen it over and over. We've watched it happen. People who are strong in the Lord begin to grow faint and then disappear altogether because a spouse is not there to stand with them or support or encourage them. The persuasion of a person's spouse. And if you're not married, choose wisely. Choose wisely. Think it through. But an equally serious faith destroyer is the perversion of exclusivity in a marriage to your spouse. What do you mean the perversion of exclusivity? You have an exclusive relationship Husbands with your wives, wives with your husbands. That is not to be violated. Oh, he's he's talking about adultery. Well, good, I don't do that. Be it through adultery, be it through pornography, which we talked about Wednesday and I gave several statistics. Let me just give you one I shared midweek. 60% of men and 30% of women are addicted to pornography. Oh, no, wait, it's 60% of Christian men and 30% of Christian men women are now addicted to pornography. And it is killing our marriages. Gentlemen, the one place, let me be graphic, the one place you're supposed to get anything sexual is from your wife. And ladies, the one place you are supposed to be satisfied sexually in a marriage is your husband. Well, but it's just pictures. If you look at a person, Jesus says, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. It is one and the same thing. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee immorality. The word immorality is pornea, where we get pornography. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? Listen, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Wouldn't it be awesome if when we went to the Internet, if any time we tried to go to a pornographic website, that when you hit the button, the first thing that would pop up on the screen would be Christ on the cross? Wouldn't that change where we went? And perhaps that's something, gentlemen, ladies, we need to be praying. Father, give me a deeper picture of Jesus on the cross. Help me see him before I see anything else. It's why Jim was weeping this morning. Let me see Jesus. I have been bought with a price. That's not a few bucks. The very life of the Son of God, that I might be a righteous person. Changed and different and not like the world. Not part of the 60% or 30%, which is shocking. Watch out. For weakness to women, King Lemuel's mother said, and for us all, be sure the opposite sex does not set you opposite from God. The second thing she warns about, wipe out the want of wine. (laughs) Wipe out the want of wine. Verse 4, it is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to desire strong drink. For they will drink and forget what is decreed. And pervert the rights of all the afflicted. Give strong drink to him who's perishing. And wine to him whose life is bitter. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his trouble no more. Now I know we've already been over this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I need to address this more specifically. For all that we studied back in Proverbs 23 about wine and about drinking, and by the way, if you haven't heard that teaching, the drink that bites back, Go to the website and listen to it. I I kid you not, it's one of the most important teachings that we've shared here. And I encourage you to go listen. But here's the thing. Here's what's going on in chapter 31. And hear this clearly. Drinking is a leadership issue. It's a leadership issue. This is what Lemuel's mother is saying with great wisdom. Drinking is a leadership issue. If you would be righteous, if you would be wise, if you would be a clear-thinking leader... And don't pass this off as some pastoral preaching requirement, by the way. If you would be a leader, drinking is a leadership issue. I'm glad someone might say, I'm not in a position of leadership. 
Are you a leader in your home? Drinking's a leadership issue. How about in the workplace? Do you lead at work? It's a leadership issue. Or how about this? Would you be used by God to lead someone to God? Drinking's a leadership issue. Wouldn't it be kind of cool, though, to be able to hang out with a friend, have a beer, and talk about Jesus? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know what? Maybe maybe uh, you can sit down and watch porn together, too. Oh, come on. Oh, all right, wait a minute. This is all just going on in my head right now, by the way. So you're saying that drinking and pornography are the same thing. I'm saying being like the world is the problem. And we still haven't figured it out. We still think that if we can kind of look like the world, then we can bait and switch them into believing in Jesus. Uh -uh. It doesn't work that way. And that's why we're not seeing more conversion in America today. Because we're too much like the world. People look at Christians and go, what's the difference? Why do it? Why bother? They're just like I am. I'm sleeping in. Why waste the time? Drinking is a leadership issue. And if you would be used by the Lord to lead someone to Christ, think this through. It is not for kings to drink wine. It is not for rulers to desire strong drink. The lost, the bitter, the impoverished, I guess go ahead. You know, if your life is bad, you have no hope, and you don't know where you're going, maybe drinking is the best thing for you. But if you would lead, we need to pray this through. The third teaching of Lemuel's mother, after wine and women, is not song. It's walk out wise judgment. Walk out wise judgment, verse 8. Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all the unfortunate. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and defend the rights of the afflicted and the needy. If there is one person Jesus was most concerned about, it's this one, the unfortunate. Hebrew for unfortunate is the bene kalof. The bene kalof means son of passing. In other words, someone who's dying. Someone who's dying, whose life is passing before their eyes. To open your mouth for the bene kalof is to cry out for the lost. Lemuel's mother says, Lemuel, you've got to look out for those. Those who are dying. Those who have no hope. Those who are lost. They're the ones you need to have a heart for, a passion for. They're the ones Jesus did. And God said in Isaiah 58, verse 5, Is it a fast like this which I choose, a day for a man to humble himself? Is it for bowing one's head like a reed and for spreading out sackcloth and ashes as a bed? Will you call this a fast? Even an acceptable day to the Lord? What's he talking about? Worship that's more about you than anything else? He says, is this not the fast which I choose? To loosen the bonds of wickedness. To undo the bands of the yoke. To let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. Now think about this. Why was it that Lemuel's mother was so concerned with the effect of wine and women on her son? Because she wisely understood the potential of these things to ruin his ability to lead well and to care about those who needed caring about. To care about the sons of passing. Those who were dying. Our righteousness is far more important than self-concern. Our righteousness is not about pulling the measure and seeing how I've grown. I'm an inch taller in righteousness. All right, yay me. It's not what our righteousness is about. It's not what it's for. I'm convinced it's why the saved of the Lord are still on earth. I've shared before, why wouldn't God just the moment we cry out, Jesus, I believe, I accept you, I, I want to be with you for all eternity. Why don't we get raptured right then? Save me a lot of trouble. Wouldn't that be great? Why does he leave us? Because you are the light of the world. You are a city set on a hill. You are, in God's economy, you are the hope through which the Holy Spirit would work. One other person may be saved because you spoke Jesus' name to them. Or two, or five, or fifty. 
That's why we're here. For the sake of the sons of passing. For the sake of the dying lost, would you be used by God to lead someone to Christ? In the same way Lemuel's mother said, lead those who are dying. Lead the lost. Lead those who are hurting and impoverished and struggling in life. And again, I say it is not by being like the world that we lead. You don't show the way by stepping off the path. 1 Peter 1.14, Peter writes, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And the pursuit of holiness, let me say it again, is not so I can say, look how holy I am. The pursuit of holiness is so that the sons of passing might see the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we pursue righteousness. That's why we want to be more holy. So that when people look at us, they can go, oh, that's Jesus. That guy's different. She's different. I want that. Now, ladies, the Proverbs end with you. As these final 22 verses, you could call them, beginning in verse 10, the ABCs of the perfect wife. ABCs, yeah, it's an alphabetical acrostic, an alphabetical acrostic. Each one of these lines, each one of the 22, beginning in order consecutively with the Hebrew alphabet, going all the way down. And it's a beautifully written thing, beginning in verse 10. An excellent wife. Who can find? And that's the question, isn't it? Where is she? Does she exist? And honestly, as we read through this, what comes to mind is who can possibly deliver this tall order? Lemuel's mother, ladies, I didn't do it, it's not my fault, please do not shoot the messenger here. (laughs) But Lemuel's mother sets the bar incredibly high. Let's make a list. For an excellent wife, who can find? Her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. So, number one, she's worthy of trust. An excellent wife is worthy of trust. Guys, let me throw this back on you. Do you trust your wife? Or do you demean her? The man who puts down or belittles or suppresses his wife is nothing more than a jerk and a fool. And I want that to be said very clearly in this fellowship. Gentlemen, if you put down your wife, if you hold her back from what God has created her to do, you are a jerk. You are an idiot. And I could use stronger language, but I think you get the point. And this excellent wife is trusted by her husband. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Ephesians 5.25 The husband's role is to give himself to his wife, which means you really trust her. doesn't mean you hold her on a short lease as though she was one of the kids or the family dog. <laughs> Speaking of the family dog, we got a bark collar. For Reggie? Oh, praise the Lord. It's one of the most wonderful things in the world. First time we put him on, and it's got this little box on it with these two tiny little metal prongs. You know, and they sit right there comfortably. They're not painful, they're not uncomfortable. But when he barks, zap! (laughs) The first time someone came to the door, because this was this has been driving me nuts. If you've come to my house, you open the door, you know it's it's hey, how's this how's it doing with the background? Shut up, Reggie, shut up. Come on in. Shut up, shut up. Get out of here, stupid. Get away. It's ridiculous. Well, the person standing in the door going, do I enter? Do I stay? I don't know. Now I see Rick's face getting red. So rather than me get upset, the first time we put it on Reggie, Mark zap, and he shot like two feet in the air. It's hilarious. Animal rights activist, he's okay, you know. But the, the, don't the fur will grow back. No. <laughs> what does that have to? I don't know. I just thought of it. The short leash, I guess, is what I thought there. It's like, but it's like hus- some husbands would, would would do that. They would put a bark collar on the wife, not literally. Obviously, that that would be inappropriate. Depends on the circumstances. 
Why don't you two meet me after? Have a little counseling. No, it's, it's not. You are to walk beside her. Together. This is a together proposition. Not, I'm out here, come on, woman, and keep the burka on. You know? Sorry. You don't hold her on any kind of leash. You walk beside her. You trust her. The more trusted she is, the more she will be the woman God called her to be. And you, husbands, have a part in that. Helping your wife be who God called her to be. And whether she measures up, by the way, to this list in Proverbs 31 or not, if you want a great godly marriage, throw away the tape and treat her like she does measure up. Look at your wives and say, wow, you're you're the Proverbs 31 gal. Verse 11, going on. The heart of her husband trusts in her. He will have no lack of gain. Verse 12, she does him good and not evil all the days of her life. Back to you, ladies. She does right by her man. She just does right by her man. Verse 13, she looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. What's that talking about? She keeps the family clothed and warm and in better style than most of us guys would be otherwise. Verse 14, (laughs) she is like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. What is this talking about? She runs a tight ship. She's got it well organized. Food on the table, organization in the home. And boy, she's up early to make sure that it all happens. Some of you guys are going, all right. (laughs) Verse 16, she considers a field and buys it. From her earnings, she plants a vineyard. Okay, so she keeps the books and brings home the bacon, or in this case, the grapes. Okay, she's working too. She's involved in the process of the household. Verse 17, she girds herself with strength and she makes her arms strong. So she finds time in all of this to go to the gym. (laughs) She's working out. All right. She's keeping in shape. Verse 18, she senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. Verse 19, she stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hands grasp the spindle. These are sewing terms. (laughs) So she's burning the midnight oil to get everything done. This excellent wife. Today we might say that she checks out all the best deals from Value Village to Macy's, you know. Maybe you're not grabbing the distaff, but again, you're, you're on to it. You know what's going on. You're, you're getting the deals. Verse 20, she extends her hand to the poor, and she stretches out her hands to the needy. So, Brian, she volunteers for homeless ministry. She's there. She's involved. She's caring, even for those outside her immediate family. This excellent wife. Verse 21. She's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She keeps her family well-dressed. Well-dressed. Man, forget Value Village. Or DKNY or Hollister. Just forget all of that. This lady's putting out handmade clothing that would make the fashionistas of the world stand up and take notice. An excellent wife, verse 22. She makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. She's looking good. She's well-dressed. She's she's well-presented. J. Vernon McGee, and I just want to share this because it made me laugh out loud. He said, young man, first you should look for a wife who is a Christian. Then I hope you get a good-looking one in the bargain. It's nice to have both. (laughs) Ladies, I, I want to say this, um, and this, this is one of those could get me in trouble. I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, looking good for your husband is important. It really is. Taking care of yourself for his sake, it really does matter. Why? The whole pornography issue we talked about. I'm not saying it's your fault if he's dabbling in that or goes down that road. I'm not saying it's your fault if he goes off and, and stupidly has an affair or checks out other women. But I'll tell you what, you can help him not go that route. Most men are very visual. Most spiritual of men. You know, walking down the street, if a beautiful woman walks by, you're going to go... <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.
<laughs> and so I'm saying to you, think about that. Keep his eyes where they need to be. Verse 23. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. Now, this doesn't mean she's home doing all the hard work and he's just sitting down having coffee with the boys. All right? That's not what it's talking about at all there. You've heard the old adage, behind every great man, there's a great woman. Well, it may be politically incorrect today, but the godly woman supports her husband's success. And the fact is, if he's sitting in the gate among the elders, he's a judge and a ruler in the land, and he has a strong woman behind him making that possible. I have a woman behind me who makes possible my ability to pastor this church. She's taken care of so much, you have no idea what she takes care of so that I can do what God has called me to do. And I thank her for it all the time. Because if not for that, I would not have the time to be the pastor God's called me to be. But I've got a strong woman behind me. Where are we? Verse 24. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. So she's running a business on the side. Verse 25. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future or the latter days. (laughs) She's looking forward to the coming of Messiah. She's looking down the road with hopefulness. The future is not a frightening thing to this excellent wife. No, she's looking ahead going, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. Verse 26, she opens her mouth in wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue, so (laughs) she homeschools. No, she's, she's engaged, gang, in the wise, kind teaching of her children, whether it's through public school and then reining them in at home to, <laughs> to reorganize some of the messed up thoughts that are taught there, or to teach at home. She truly focuses on that. Let me say to both moms and dads, don't leave the teaching of your children to other people, even to church. That's your responsibility. It's our responsibility. And by the way, in verse 26, this is interesting to me, the phrase teaching of kindness. Do you know what teaching of kindness is in the Hebrew? It's Torah chesed. What's that? The law of grace. Torah of grace. It's one of the few places I've I've found this. It may be the only place where Torah of grace, where that phrase is used. That's astounding. What does that say? It says that the law of grace is a picture of grace. Well, we know the law brings us to Jesus, so there you go. Who is grace? Torah law points us to Jesus Christ. Verse 27. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and bless her. Her husband also, and he praises her, saying, verse 29, many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. She's praised by her husband. She's praised by her kids. She's probably even praised by the family dog, you know, as soon as she takes off the bark collar. (laughs) Now, seriously, a wife of this caliber deserves the thanks and honor and praise all that her family can give her. Don't hold it back. Husbands, don't hold back praise of your wife. Don't think, well, I gave her some last week. I'm just going to wait, you know, because I don't want to get her to get big headed here. (laughs) I'll praise her when she's earned it. Hey, she earns it by being (laughs) your wife, right? (laughs) Praise her. (laughs) Verse 30. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. This good-looking, well-dressed, husband-loving, child-rearing, business-keeping, hard-working, volunteering superwoman (laughs) is also proverb fulfilling because on top of everything else she fears the Lord she fears the Lord she doesn't fear her husband she doesn't fear her kids she doesn't fear her in-laws she fears the Lord and you know Solomon addressed the fear of the Lord 14 times in the book of Proverbs 14 different times we've run across the fear of the Lord. Chapter 9, verse 10 tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So you go through the list 
And the more I read it, the more I thought, man, I'm so glad this was, these are the words spoken by a woman because otherwise I'm not sure that women would want to hear it. Some jerk man was writing this. Well, he has no idea what my life is like, so we're just, you know. <laughs> these are the words of a woman. These are the words given by a mother to her son about what an excellent wife looks like. Ladies, who can measure up to this? I mean, let's be honest just for a moment. Get out the measuring tape. How many of you in the barn this morning measure up to this list in Proverbs 31? No hands? Oh, that was the right choice. (laughs) He just canceled the the counseling session is what he did. It's good because I'm on vacation, man. I'm out of here. Who measures up? You know, honestly, I think that's the idea behind the whole chapter. What is? Listen. In the annals and the chronicles of the kings of Israel and Judah, listen, there is no King Lemuel. It doesn't exist. There's no King Lemuel. Even in the surrounding countries, no record anywhere of a king by the name of Lemuel. Well, there was a king who wrote the vast majority of the Proverbs of this book. His name was Solomon. And I believe, and many conservative scholars would agree, that Lemuel is Solomon. What would that make King Lemuel's mother? Bathsheba. We may, and we can't say conclusively, but we may have just gone through the words of Bathsheba for her son Solomon. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. Bathsheba, who lost her firstborn son because he was born of an adulterous affair that she had with David. 2 Samuel 12.24 tells us David comforted his wife Bathsheba, went into her and lay with her, and she gave birth to a son, and he named him Solomon. And now the Lord loved him and sent word through Nathan the prophet, and he named him Jedidiah for the Lord's sake. You see, God had a nickname for Solomon, Jedidiah. God's nickname meant beloved of Yahweh. Jedidiah, beloved of Yahweh. I love this kid. What do you think that did for Bathsheba? To hear that God so approved of this little baby, her second born. And I think Lemuel, whose name means for God, I think Lemuel was a nickname too. It was Bathsheba's nickname for little Solomon. Which sheds a completely different light on this chapter and on the conclusion of the book of Proverbs. Bathsheba knew the pitfalls of women. She had been a pitfall for David. Whether she originally intended to or not, she knew what a woman could do to a man and how a woman could cause a man to stumble and to fall. She knew the danger of wine and strong drink and where it could lead. She knew she also saw wise and kind and compassionate leadership in David, who was a great leader. And she must have wondered... An excellent wife. Who can find? Who can find? I mean, how many of you wives would rate yourselves as superb? What woman among us feels like after reading through this? And I try, it's difficult, but I tried to put myself in, in, you know, in your shoes, ladies, and read this and go, wow, I don't have the energy to do this. I couldn't accomplish this. I couldn't measure up here. And honestly, what man among us, be careful, gentlemen, what man among us thinks he deserves such a woman? Not one. No, not one. (laughs) Did Bathsheba love Uriah, her first husband? Did she grieve his loss when he was murdered on the battlefield? Did she even know? I don't know if she knew that David was the one who set it up. But did she grieve the loss of that man? Or did she willingly go along with the charades and the chicanery and the and the the crimes of David? Did she carry the shame of her own adultery and the sorrow of her first husband's death and of her first child's death? Did she bear all of that? You know, when Solomon came along, David called him, David called him peace. 
Solomon, this one, because now there's peace in Israel, my son, I'm going to name peace. And of course, the Lord named him Beloved. And perhaps Bathsheba named him Lemuel for God because in his birth, she felt like, I've been given a second chance, this one's for God. You've given me a son, I am giving him back to you. Now, that's, that's all surmise on my part. But this I know to be absolute truth. When the genealogy of Jesus Christ is given in Matthew chapter 1, we see her name there. Bathsheba. Listed, by the way, among three other questionable women. Tamar, who disguised herself as a prostitute and slept with her father-in-law. She's in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Or Rahab, that former prostitute who received the spies of Israel at Jericho. Or Ruth who was a Moabite and an absolute outsider to the people of Israel. And then in Matthew chapter 1, verse 6, we run across the name Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, the adulteress with David. Book of Proverbs is a call to wise and righteous and sanctified living, a wise walk on earth. And listen, now that we're at the end, it is impossible for any of us to live out the words of the Mishle. It's impossible. It's, it's, it's too demanding. It's too... Roll out the tape. We can't measure up to this book. But for one thing, the redemption of Jesus Christ. Now we've quoted this verse many, many times over the last six months, but listen to how it concludes by His doing your in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God. And righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. Redemption. So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And I, for one, fully expect to see Bathsheba in heaven. Because based on the words of Proverbs 31, if in fact these are the words of Bathsheba for Solomon, for little Lemuel, as she would have called him in the palace, tucking him in at night, good night, Lemuel. A name known between Solomon and his mother. If these words are her words, this is a woman who knew God. And this is a woman who sensed redemption by the hand of the Father. How tall are you? How do you measure up? How high is the measure of your righteousness? I'll give you the exact height of righteousness. The righteous requirements of God are just as tall as the height of Calvary's cross where Jesus paid for our complete and total redemption. Gentlemen, ladies, you are redeemed in Jesus Christ and made righteous by Jesus. And Paul prayed in Ephesians 3.17 that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Father, this is our prayer, that we might, as Paul said, be filled up to all the fullness of God, that the height of our righteousness is measured, Jesus, in you. That the length of our righteousness is measured, Jesus, in the lengths to which you went to secure redemption for us. Father, we wouldn't have a a hope of being different in the world except that the Spirit of Christ washes us, renews us, and calls us to a different life. May we be wise in Jesus. Father, may the women here this morning be redeemed by Christ and not by any actions of their own. Faith in You, Lord. May the men here this morning, may we all recognize our redemption in Jesus Christ alone. And it's in His name we pray. Amen.